One of the images that I wanted to show is that the church is to train the saints, not to entertain them. A lot of the world has gotten caught up in entertainment, even a church, where our goal and our mission is to be disciples and then also to train disciples. Uh, I know that you're here for that reason too as well. And, and what the Lord is really speaking to this body about is vision for the future. What is it you're believing for this time tomorrow, which is like in the immediate, this time next year, and then also five years or seven years down the road? What is your, your long-term vision? What is it that you want to see be accomplished? What is it that you are believing God to do? And I believe that the, there are some things that are going on in the world today in this, for this body. This is not just a word. This is the word, for the word of the Lord for this body. He's saying to us that we have a season and a time to prepare. To prepare the net. To get strong in our faith and build uh, our faith. And then also to help to build the people around us. I feel strongly that it's going to be about seven years. That's what I hear in my spirit. I feel that we have seven years where it's going to be good. Just like in Joseph's time. I was like brought back to that. It's going to be good for seven years. But in seven years after that, there's going to be a time of difficulty. A time of trial. And the Lord's saying to me, is like, get ready, Rob. Get ready. Don't be deceived by what's going on right now. And the things. But you know what? Get ready. Be prepared and get the people ready and get the people prepared. Because there is a time that's coming. There is going to be a time of difficulty. Like in Joseph's time, Joseph had seven years of plenty, but then there were seven years that the famine came upon the land. And then Joseph, because of his wisdom, because he had followed the instructions that the Lord had given to him, he was prepared. We have no reason to fear family. None at all. I know in this world, everybody's like afraid. There's, and the news gets better ratings because they inspire fear. That's the way of the world. But the, the, the Lord is really speaking to, to us and He's saying to us and He's saying through me to you, He's saying to you, get, get your vision. Be prepared. What are you believing for? What do you, what do you want to see accomplished in your life? Pray to Him too and ask Him, what does He want to see accomplished in your life? Why did He bless you with the things that He gave you? He asked him, why did he give me the marriage that he did? Why did he give me the children that he did? Why did he give me the relationships that he did? Why did he heal me, deliver me, set me free? It is for us, but then there's a reason and a purpose for those things too as well. We're going to examine a woman's life. Uh, the same woman that we spoke about last week, the Shunammite woman. And we're going to continue to examine her life because she, she has a life that's marked with miracles. I want that for you. I want that for me. The man that God used in the Shunammite woman's life was Elisha. Elisha is significant for us because Elijah accomplished 16 miracles. Elisha, they say 32 miracles are recorded in the Bible. It was a double portion. How many of you would want a double portion? Amen. You don't want just your portion, but you know what? You want a double portion. And, I, and if you don't want that, I would ask you, what's wrong with you? <laughs> If you want to get that second portion, you get it, then you bring it over here and we'll find something to do with it. Because God wants His kingdom to be advanced. It's too many times people have said some things that have almost demotivated the body of Christ. There are three words that I'm going to share with you today. And these are the three words that in these six verses that the Lord had leap off of the pages as we discuss this. And this is, a, this is an important word for this body. The first one is Revelation. The second one is return. And then the last one is restoration. So revelation, return, and restoration. Revelation, return, and restoration. We live in the information age. People can get information all over. What they have is a lot of information, but no wisdom. Here, let me get, let's track history. 2001, there was a calamity. This was what the Lord was bringing to me as we were coming to the, as I was coming to the service. So this is, in, I mean, this is like fresh off the presses from the Lord to me to share with you guys. 
2001, the towers came down and everybody said, we'll never forget. They forgot. The churches mm -hmm. packed out. Everybody was like, the, there were so many people that were going to church that were thinking about all of these different things. And you know what? They, we said we'd never forget, but we forgot. Mm -hmm. And people forgot. Mm -hmm. Do you know this? Somebody told me this, and I thought, oh, I got to really research it. I can see it being true. They said that if everybody in the United States went to church on any given Sunday, there would not be enough seats in of all of the churches in this nation to contain all the people that say they're Christians. You know, why is that a telling statistic? Why is that a telling fact? Because people are, are not consistent in their, in their belief system. And that's what the Lord is really, He's saying to us, He's saying, be consistent. He's reminding us to be consistent, to be ready. It, it does say in the scripture that He's going to come like a thief in the night, right? He's not going to always, He wants us to be in a state of readiness. So in 2001, the towers came down. 2008, the market crashed. In 2020, COVID came. Every time, everybody, it was always the same. People keep going back and they keep forgetting. And they keep forgetting. The Holocaust happened. They said, we'll never forget, but people forget. We forget. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, people were, it says in the scriptures, it says over and over again, remember, it says forget not, but we forget. So the Lord is saying to me, Rob, don't forget. Keep your vision before you. And in this, in this life of busyness, where people almost wear busyness as a badge of honor, don't forget your vision. Pray, seek. What is it that you're believing for today? What is it you're believing for tomorrow? What are you believing for next year? What are you believing for in seven years? In 2 Kings chapter 8, it says, Then spake Elisha, that's King James Version, Then spoke Elisha unto the woman, whose son he had restored to life saying, Arise and go thou and you, your household, and sojourn, or dwell, wherever you can dwell, or sojourn. For the Lord has called for a famine, and it shall also come upon the land seven years. And I was like, man, seven years again, Lord. Yeah. You're trying to tell me something? Yeah. It's, it's, it's really kind of like sinking home. It's like, we, gotta, we have to have a long-term vision. You know, the, sometimes people are like, well, uh, God, God, is, God is spontaneous, but He's also a God of order. You know, when you see in the tabernacle, did He give us every detail on how to create the tabernacle? Did He give us every detail on how to uh, create Noah's Ark? Did He give us every detail in how we were to prepare and to carry the Ark? Yes, He did. And I believe that the Lord is get downloading into us in instructions that we need to receive for the fullness of His blessing in our lives. Just like the Shunammite woman. The Shunammite woman, she, she just got a small thing. And that was why it was important for her just in the immediate. Well, you know what? I don't really know why, but I feel strongly that I should do this. So she prepares a place for the man of God. And then the man of God feels res, res, uh, like to respond back to her kindness. The law of reciprocity, the law of sowing and reaping. So he asked her, what can be done for her? And she, she didn't really want to share what it was because it was almost like it was too big. Like she didn't want to share. Have you ever believed God for something? It's like, you know what? I don't even want to get my hopes up for that. Well, that's the area that God very often wants to, to work in. At least in my life, he did that. I was like, I didn't really want to get my hopes up for any of the things. So I, I didn't really want to bring them. But he's saying, that's the area I want to work in. He wants you to get your hopes up and believe for. So he, he, the man of God tells Elisha or Elijah that uh, she didn't have a son. So miraculously, she next this time next year she has a son. That son falls ill and dies, and the the man of God raises the child from the dead. Well, now this is where we are in Second Kings chapter eight. The child is raised from the dead. Uh, the woman is, the, the woman is being told now, and she's listening, which is important because a lot of people are told things and they just don't listen. She's being told something. I want you to know this about God. God reveals things to his people. Let's go to Amos chapter 3 verse 7. You can get that up there. Call an audible. He reveals things to his people. He'll let us know. It says in Amos chapter 3 verse 7. It says, surely the Lord will do nothing. He will do nothing. 
but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. God's going to keep me in the know. That's why I can have confidence for the future. He's going to keep me in the know. He's going to let me know. He's going to give me inside information. He's going to give you inside information to those that are listening. Those that are keeping their ear down to the ground and inclined to heaven. And they're listening and they're watching it. Because he wants to give instruction to his children to help them avoid some of the difficulties. So he speaks to the woman. He tells the shooter, my woman, there's going to be a famine in this land. I want you to go from this and move your feet. I'm setting you up for success. There's a lot of people, they say, well, you know what? I mean, you hear this all the time in church. Well, I need to read the word. And it's almost cliche, but then people don't do it. The Bible says that in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, it doesn't say knowing the word is going to lead to good success. It says doing the word is going to lead to good success. This is what I learned is there's a big gap between knowing and doing. And I want to bridge the no do gap. <laughs> I want to bridge the gap because this is what I hear from people all, all the time. I know, I know, I know. And I want to be like, well, the proof's in the pudding. Do it. See the results. Why? Because God wants to do something in your life that only He can do. And He wants us to get past knowing to, into doing because He's called us through the Apostle James to be doers of the Word, not just hearers of the Word. There's a lot of people that they've been in church for a long time and they've heard the Word and they can almost recite. There are unsaved people that can give to you for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. But it's the in the doing, the, the Shunammite woman, I believe if she didn't obey, she wouldn't have re received the results. And now in this, as we're preparing, in the Shunammite woman, she was following the instructions. And he, he said for seven years, think about where the Shunammite woman is. Her husband had passed. Her son died. Rose back from, rose back to life. Now she's probably settled. Back then, women couldn't really own anything. And the man of God's telling her, you need to follow this instruction. You need to move from there to here. I would be like, what, are you kidding me? That's my whole support system. That's my income. God, that's the way God is, though. He calls us to do that. He calls us to put our trust in Him for the vision. And it's not, uh, it's not just knowing. This is what I, I want you to write this down. It's implementing the word that is valuable. Implementing the word is valuable. Knowing it is not doing it. Implementing the word is where it's valuable. Here, let me give you an example. There was a guy 10 years ago. He's like, yeah, you know what? Uh, I know that I should invest in this. And another guy knew it and did it. Who received the, the benefits of it? The guy who knew it and did it. Well, just recently, the Lord had done something with, with me. And I was, it was a small thing. It wasn't in an investment area or anything like that. But I was like, and I saw such a huge result from it. From one small act of obedience. And that's the way the Lord is. He says this, if we will keep our heart right. As he delivers the vision to you. And this is what I hear. Some people are getting visions, but I, I, I feel the spirit of pride. This is what a spirit of pride is. The spirit of pride is this, is that God can't do that in my life. That's pride. Who are you to say that God can't do that in your life? Let me challenge you in that. Who are you to question God? Who am I to question God? God doesn't want your opinion. He wants your obedience. Yes, right. So sometimes when we hear this, why not? Can that be done? Hey, Moses could have aborted the vision for his life at 80 years old. He could have said, I'm too old. The Shunammite could have aborted the vision and just said, you know what? I can't do those things because you know, there's a lot of reasons. We can talk ourselves out of the destiny and plan that God has for our lives. We can let the enemy talk us out because he's out to steal, kill, and destroy. And there is, this is what I found is that the enemy can leave you alive and still steal your life. Yeah. The enemy can steal your life while you're still alive. I've watched people. They're dead. Thousand yards stare. They're just dead inside. 
I was joking with somebody about a thousand yards there earlier, so don't, 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 don't that's not what I meant. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. There was a gentleman, and I'll never forget the day, I went to him and I spoke to him, and he was inside, he was afraid to leave the house, and all these different things. The enemy stole his life while he was alive. You know, he, he, he wants to steal our courage. He wants to steal a, that our courage to go and to do something. And that's where the miracle is. Sometimes it only takes like 30 seconds of radical courage to change a person's life. That's all it takes. Just 30 seconds. The Shunammite woman, she kept her heart right before the Lord. And this is what the scripture tells me. And I'm just sharing this with you. Because i got to remind myself of it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And he shall direct your paths. Sometimes we want to direct our own paths. This is a scripture that says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 and 16, 25. It's repeated. I was like, well, you know what? When God repeats himself, sure, I think we should listen, right, Sam? Yeah. It says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end leads to death. Whoa, I don't want that, Lord. I want to follow your path. I want to keep my heart right. This is what I found. Is when we keep our heart right before the Lord, he starts to speak to us. And then we'll follow his path. And then he'll direct us to things that only he can do. There's some things that you have. There's some passions that you have, family. There's things that you love to do. Well, God, put those passions inside of you. And he wants you to follow those passions. He wants you to follow those desires that line up with his word. He's created us. He wants us to be engaged. He doesn't want us just to endure life. I feel bad a lot of times. I see people, they're just enduring life. They go to a job that they hate. They deal with people that they hate. You know? this, is, this is me. I'm not, I feel like I'm the richest man in Naples. I honestly do. I, I get to hang out with people I love all day long. Do what I love to do all day long. I mean, I, I, I mean I, I'm blessed. Blessed beyond measure. I, that's why I say that. There's, there are other people that they're just, they're just enduring life. Do you know what I'm saying? God wants to get many of us past some of the things that we, we're, we've been enduring into a life that only He can give to us. A job can provide a living, but only God can give a life. So it says in verse 3, 2 Kings chapter 8. Now we're in the return. So the revelation. We need your revelation, Lord. Tell us what it is that you want for my life. Not what I want for my life. Seek him first for the vision. I, I, this, this is what I am not saying. I'm not saying uh, it's something that you decide what you want to do and ask God to co-sign it. That's not the way he works. You ask him what he wants for your life and you pray. And it's not going to be something that you hate. It's going to be something that's going to be tied into your heart. What he created you for. God's not mean or nasty. Like in the, I shared this morning. Thomas Edison said this, it's kind of cruel and it's just wrong to ask. Can you, you'd always be disappointed if you asked a fish to climb a tree. It's, a fish wasn't created to climb a tree, it's created to swim. We were created for something and God wants to engage us for the mission of our life and it's attached to the vision. And when we're attached to that vision, he'll bring the provision for all the areas of our life, just like he did for the shooting white woman. There's a return and it says this, in verse 3, And it came to pass at the end of seven years that the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines and she went forth to cry unto the king for her land, and, uh, for her house and for her land. When she got back, she wanted what, her home back. She wanted her uh, land back. She wanted her house back. And the king talked with Gehazi, the servant, the man of God, saying, Tell me, I pray thee, all the great things that Elisha has done. So what's going on in that verse is that Gehazi, who is... Elisha's servant is speaking to the king on behalf of Elisha and the Shunammite woman enters in on the scene. These are some of the things that I've learned about God. When you're ready, it will come. When I was a young man, I wished, man, you know what? I would have an opportunity. I would get a chance. I would get a break. This is what I learned as an older man. I wish I could tell, as an old man, I could tell the young guy this. Don't focus on perfect conditions. Grow. Be ready for the opportunity of a lifetime. Because too many people are not ready for the opportunity of a lifetime in the lifetime of the opportunity. Opportunities slip between their fingers all the time because they're not ready. Because they can't handle it. 
And I learned this, is that opportunity is everywhere. People ask me, I was like, what did we get? No, opportunity is everywhere. We need to choose which one we want. We need to seek the Lord. But more importantly, we need to be ready. The best thing that you can do for the people that you love is invest in yourself. Does that, is that selfish? No, that's not. That's you taking care of you, growing in, in your skills, your talents, your abilities, so that you can stand and you can influence the people that you care most for. When you're ready, it'll come. It's that easy. If you want a great, if you want a wonderful wife, be a great man. If you want uh, to be successful in business, be faithful right now. If you want to affect people's lives, if you're a teacher called to teach nations, teach right now. If you're going to uh, develop a song that nobody's ever heard, well, then that means you sometimes have to play a song that's never been heard. You got to do it right now. This is the, this is the hard, easiest thing to move. Have you ever tried to move a car that's in neutral? I mean, that takes a lot of effort. But when it's in park, it's really bad. <laughs> we were pushing this one car, we're trying to get it going, and then somebody had put it in park, and I was just like, well, why is this thing not moving? We're kind of strong. I mean, there's like a bunch of us, it's just not moving. It was in park. <laughs> but if you push the car, and not in park, but in neutral, you know this. How many of you have done this, by the way? Have you ever? All right. Once that car starts moving, you don't want the person hitting the brake. And what do they always say? It's easier to steer when the car is moving. Moving. Boom. Oh, thank you. I like this guy. <laughs> it's easier to move. When we're doing something, it's easier for God to direct us. He's saying to us, he's saying, do something. Get ready. Be prepared because the opportunities are going to come. Do what you do so well. If you want promotion, do what you do so well that you have time to add to it. This is where a lot of people, I've discipled a lot of young men, and they're like, man, you know what, I just barely can handle all the stuff that I got. Well, you know what, don't, you know, don't ask for more. This is what you focus in on, handle what you got better, and then God will bring you more. So it's not asking for greater opportunities, it's being ready for the great opportunities that he's already given to us. And this is God, he's not holding back. God wants to give us this is what I found about the Lord. It says that He wants to give me the kingdom. He wants to give you the kingdom. Fear not, little flock. It is my good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I say to you this morning, there's opportunity everywhere. The Shunammite woman, she obeyed at the right time. There is, that's critical for all of us as we receive the vision. He's going to give us divine favor. He's going to cause something. Sometimes it's just 30 seconds. There's been so many critical junctures in my life that I'm like, man, I could have missed that if I was 30 seconds, 30 seconds late or 30 seconds early. I got to just recently, it just happened. If I had waited or delayed, the blessing would have been aborted. If I would have waited just 12 hours, it would have been aborted. And this is what the Lord is looking for from you and I in this season. Is he gives us this vision, instant obedience, instant obedience. He's looking for us to obey at the right time so that He can pour out that abundant blessing upon us. He's impressed that upon me. This is what I also believe. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Did you get that? Delayed obedience is disobedience. My son Timothy taught me something uh, when he, about five years ago, maybe 10 years ago. I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm going to teach my kids the Bible. <laughs> Out of, the babe, out of the mouths of babes. So we went, we read the parable of the two sons, and I'm going to read it to you. Uh, you don't have to put it on a projection screen, but I'm going to read it to you. But what do you think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in the, my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. Not my house, not your house either, but that's the way it was there. But afterward, he repented and went. So he repented and he went. And he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. So one son said, nah, I'm not going to do it. But then he went and did it. The other son said, I'm going to do it, just didn't do it. Which of the two did the will of his father? They say unto him, the first. Jesus saith unto them, verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. 
For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not, but the publicans and the harlots believed him, and you, when you had seen it, repented not afterward that you might not believe him. We'll let the bells go. So I asked my son, and I used the word incorrectly, I asked my son, who obeyed? There was two sons, right? I asked them, we're doing a Bible lesson, who obeyed? Well, it says that one of them did the will of the Father. My son Timothy goes like this, he said, Dad, neither one of them obeyed. And he was 100% right. One did the will of the Father, but neither one of them obeyed. Obedience is this, when you are here, when you hear from the Lord, you don't tell him, no, you don't ask for five confirmations, you do what he tells you. It's that easy. So that there, neither one of those sons obeyed, one of them ended up doing the will of the Father, but that's not our goal, our goal is to obey when he speaks to us, and that's what the Shunammite did, she obeyed, and this is what happened, because she obeyed, she came back at just the right time. Can you imagine if the Shunammite woman would have come 30 seconds, maybe 10 minutes late? She would have missed the conversation that Elisha was having with the king. Seven years, seven years. Talk about timing. God's timing is way better than my timing. It, it, he's, sometimes we want things and they're a little bit too early. He's letting it percolate. He's letting it brew. He's going to get ready to give it to you at just the right time. Sometimes we want, he's never late. He's never early. He's always on time. That's the thing about God. So if she would have waited a little bit longer, she would have missed her opportunity. She would have missed the opportunity of a lifetime. But she was so attuned to what the Father was saying, was so attuned to listening to the word of the Lord that she went at the right time. She went to the king and she spoke to the king at just the right time as he's having that conversation and Gehazi goes to her. Oh, she just walks in. As, he's, as Gehazi is speaking about all the things that Elisha had done, now she walks in and she's able to share about the miracle that had taken place. Talk about a setup for Elisha, Gehazi, and for the widow. And this is what ends up happening to the Shunammite woman. Restoration. This word restoration, I was like, well, there, some of us, the enemy is soul in some things. My, God's, my God is a God of restoration. But when he gives it back to you, he likes to give it to you better than before. New and improved. All throughout the Bible, I see it like, uh, you know, the children of Israel, they went into, they came out on the other side of those walls of water better than they did when they went in. The, the Egyptians, think about this, the Egyptians were like trying to give them all their stuff as they're leaving. I'm like, where does that happen? But God's divine favor. The prophet Elijah is by the brook Cherith and God uses ravens, those greedy little birds, <laughs> ravens to provide for the man of God. That, for the woman of God. That's the way God is. He wants to do things in a way that he'll get the glory. So the, the, the return is, or the difficulty, or the famine is just a setback. A set, that setback is just a setup for the comeback. God is looking. He, he likes to make the story interesting. That's the Lord. He likes to make the story interesting. So this is what restoration is. Restoration, I looked up the word, and I was like, this kind of be, it's rejuvenation. I believe that the Lord wants to rejuvenate some people. You haven't done so anything, you know, you're doing anything wrong, but He wants you to have more life, more vigor, more strength, more health, more enjoyment. He wants to get you out of enduring, but He wants to get you into a different place in life. There's some people, they want, they, they want to have more time to do more ministry. Well, God wants to bless you and take care of some of your needs. Yeah, I know. I mean, we all have a heart to do ministry, but sometimes it's like we need, there's practical needs that need to be met. But God wants to do those things for us. He wants to rejuvenate some people. He wants to regenerate. He wants to resurrect. This is what the re word resurrection, and I feel this, is that there are some dreams that we let go of. We let go of them, and the Lord wants to res resurrect them. And some people, I don't want to challenge you not to abort it again, again, again. Because there's some people, that, they almost make a habit pattern out of being Eeyore the donkey. Eeyore the donkey, I love the Winnie the Pooh, but Eeyore the donkey, he would walk around, woe is me, it's a bad day. 
hey, I got problems. I said I was blessed, but I got problems all day long. There, this is what I want to encourage you to do and to challenge you not to do. Do not abort the vision that God has given to you. Amen. He's trying to resurrect it, so don't try and kill it again. Wow. Believe it. Don't wait for the other shoe to drop. Let that go. Some people want pity instead of prosperity. They, they want to settle for that. They want to settle for empathy from other people instead of getting the victory in their lives. I want to challenge you not to do that because it's hollow. It's empty. God wants to bring you into a place. He wants to resurrect dreams so that you can become a Joseph. He wants you to be a blessing to people and to your family and to a nation. That's what Joseph did. What's the difference between Joseph? I asked this this morning. What's the difference between Joseph and Moses? Gideon? Absolutely nothing. There's no difference between you and them. They put on their pants the same way. This is what I found. S some mega successful people. I used to be intimidated by them. I thought, oh, you know, this person's super well here. They put their pants on the same way that I do. They put their shoes on the same way. I get the president, same thing. All of the different people, they put, they're the same. You know what? You want to impress me? Rise from the dead. Yeah. You want to impress me? Be around in 200 years. That's what's impressive. King of kings, the Lord of lords. That's what's impressive. I'm following after his example. I want to encourage you to follow after his example also. Don't be like the Pharisees. Measure yourself according to other people. Listen, everybody's, everybody's highlight reel looks good. You want to know what their highlight reel is? Go on their Facebook page. Yeah. Everybody put like, oh, they got a dream world. I remember counseling a couple. That life was falling apart. I'm not, and there's nobody here. That life was falling apart. But you go and look on their Facebook page, right, Joe? We were like, what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? You're like posting those pictures? It's like, don't compare your home video with somebody else's highlight reel. I want to challenge you not to do that because God has a better vision and a better plan for you than probably theirs and they're probably just trying to make it look good to you. This is the other word, reinstatement. There are some people, there's a reinstatement. That's what the Lord did for the widow. He reinstated the widow. Let's read verse 5. And it came to pass as he was telling the king how he had restored a dead body to life, that behold, a woman whose son he had restored to life cried to the king for her house and her land. And Gehazi said, My lord, O king, this is the woman, and this is her son, whom Elisha restored to life. And when the king asked the woman, she told him, So the king appointed unto her an officer, saying, Restore all that was hers, and all the fruits of the field since the day that she left the land even until now. So let me read to you a couple points that I wrote down. Everything was restored to her. She didn't have a way of making a living, and really she needed this. What she gave up was really an investment, an investment, and God brought back to her everything that she thought she had lost. And I declare that of you. Everything that you think that the enemy stole for you, this is how big God is. And I want to encourage you to wrap your faith around because God can restore it. In Joel chapter 2 verse 25, that's one of the scriptures that I stood on home for many years. God will restore to you back to you what the locust and the cankerworm tried to devour. God will restore that back to you. He restored back to the Shunammite woman everything that she had. Guess, guess what? She didn't just get her house and her land back. She got all the proceeds while she was away. Man, that's, that's God showing off. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage you, family, and I'm receiving his encouragement as we believe for this vision. We want to stop the naysayers. We don't want to listen to the antagonist. The protagonist is trying to lead us and direct us into the future that he has for us. So don't listen to the voice of the enemy. Mm -hmm. Listen to the voice of God and keep going in that direction. Because mm -hmm. God's plan will be fulfilled. All the increase of her land since the day that she had left and been given back to her. Seven years. Why is that so significant? Seven is perfect restoration. The number seven, in, in, when you talk about it in the Bible, it means perfect. It means complete. God's restoration and His vision. This is what I know about vision. 
And I want to, I want to encourage you in this too. As we're believing, you don't need to convince everybody. There was a time where I had to just stop talking to people about the vision. Because they were, it was almost like they were trying to talk me out of it. I want to encourage you, let your vision speak for itself. That's what it says in Habakkuk. It will speak for itself. When God does that, I bet you everybody wanted to know what the Shunammite woman's secret was when she came back. Seven years later, everybody was coming. Hey, how? And, and that's, that became a platform for her to talk about how good her God was. That's your God. That's my God. So as we close this service this, this morning, I want to remind you about what the Lord is saying. And next week or the week after, I'm going to be going over success and the roles that we have. We want to be successful in more than one role. Thank you for raising your hand. We want to be successful in taking the offering today, too. Praise God. Angel shared a story this morning that was so touching. There was a woman that did, was that, it was a little while ago, right? All right, I'm blending them in. Wasn't that a touching story? Yeah. A woman didn't finish school. Because she didn't have the shoes. Can we set somebody up for success? Yeah, absolutely. Maybe, maybe it's not in that kind of situation, but maybe we can make it a little bit more joyful for a child to go to school. I don't know if you've ever had a hole in your shoe on your first day of school, but I have. I don't know if you've ever not had clothes, the right kind of clothes when you were starting school, but I have. And it's almost like an embarrassment that you have. But we can, we can make it that much better. We can help people. We can help the children to enjoy. Last year, we had a child that was so blessed. Or a year before that, was so blessed that the child was crying as they received their shoes. And that made everybody else who watched it cry. It's making me want to cry right now. We can be a part of that. And we are a part of that. And who knows how we change that young girl's life. And then she changes other people's lives. God does that all the time. Ch uh, chain reactions and domino effects. So I'm going to ask, we're going to close by being partners with God. Thank you, ushers. How many of you this morning got the vision? Praying about a vision. Oh, if your vision, uh, I want as we're getting ready, as we're praying, and I want you to continue to pray about it. If your vision only involves you, it's too small. Your vision has to involve. If it, your vision is just about you, then it needs to be attached to the kingdom of God. Because that's why God does things. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. It says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, it says, God is not forgetful. He's not unrighteous. Everything that you do for His children, He'll find a way to, some, some way, somehow bless you in return. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 42, it says that if we... We give a cup of water to one of his children, that he will find a way to reward us too as well. Amen. So this morning, as it was we're asking the Lord, what is our part in the back to school backpack outreach? Maybe you can't go and shop for shoes. Maybe you can't go out to the store and get backpacks. Well, you know what? We have people that do great jobs with shopping. We just had somebody go into Walmart and they, they put a, a power demand upon the management. <laughs> And they asked, can we have that sale for all the shoes in the store? And I guess they were changing the inventory. And they said, yes. So there was carts of shoes that people left with. You, what I'm saying to you this morning is that maybe you can't be the person that goes out and does those things, but you can certainly sew into it. So please, come as you're ready. Sew whatever it is that the Lord wants you to sew into. I promise you this. I promise you. As a man of God, every cent that you give will go towards getting shoes or backpacks to children. It is going nowhere else. And it's going to be making a difference in this community. We don't know. Sometimes people say, well, you know what? I don't like the way things are going in our community. Somebody had said this, and he wasn't a good man. He says, if you have the youth, you have the future. That's so true. If you have the youth, you have the future. Let's sow into the future. Let's sow into the children. Let's be a witness to them. I want to thank you guys for that too as well. So a couple people come on up. We'll, we'll wait for you. You're worth it. You're worth it. You're worth it. Let's pray over the offering this morning.
Lord, we thank you that a couple of years ago you gave to us a God-sized vision to have the back-to-school backpack outreach, Lord, and we didn't even have the resources for it, but you did. My brothers and my sisters, Lord, as they've sown, some might not have had the resources, but Lord, you do. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless them supernaturally and powerfully, Lord. Every seed that was sown, Lord, let it be multiplied back to the sower a hundredfold, Lord. Father, that they would have more for, uh, to, for themselves and their needs, Lord, but also to do and accomplish the work of the kingdom. We thank you, Lord, that you'll supernaturally increase every cent that was given. Lord, that you will also, Lord, provide deals and bargains, Lord, so that we can get the shoes and the backpacks and the supplies that we need to be a blessing to this community, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for the privilege and honor that you give to us to be your sons and daughters and to represent you, Lord. We give you honor, praise, and glory, and we thank you, Lord. I thank you for this wonderful family, Lord. Let them know how much you love them and how much we love them and how grateful we are to be a part of this family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus loves you guys.